All right, welcome everyone who's uh, waiting for our webinar to start. We will be getting started at the top of the hour. Um, but until then, it would be great for you to let us know who you are and where you're coming from. And we can, we can kind of narrate the chat waterfall as uh, before we get started. Uh, we had a great one this morning with people literally from around the world. That's always so much fun, right? So um, have a feeling maybe to, this one's gonna be a little bit more North America centric or North, uh, uh, North America, South America, but uh, welcome and we will get started in about five minutes or so. We already have California and mm. Alberta, Canada, Vancouver, Bethlehem. Georgetown, Guyana. Guyana. There we go. Ah. That's pretty cool. Thanks for joining us. Let me make sure. There we go. Oh, yes. It is happening. Bahrain. Must be pretty late at night. see who the first person is that one of us knows that comes up in the chat, right? <laughs> There's always someone, always someone. I saw a couple of people this morning at 7 a.m. that I, I hadn't talked to or seen in a long, long time. That was pretty fun. So, oh, I know Homa. <laughs> <laughs> I know John in Montreal. There you go. And I like uh, people know each other on the chat. So they're saying, oh, there's my friend, Tammy Kita. Hi, Tim. <laughs> I knew, Tammy, I, knew Homa, I knew Homa was going to win this. You know, <laughs> uh -huh. no, we usually do well. I don't think She's anyone been everywhere. Homa. Yes, I know. No, you know. Oh, and then there's Lisa Persky, who's a really good friend. So hi, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa in Brasilia. And we've got a good representation from the Philly suburbs, which is fun. Ohio. All right. Very fun. We're expecting a few hundred people in this session now. So we'll see how that goes. And we'll get started in about three or four minutes. A lot of Philly representation. Yes, absolutely. And Honduras. Bettendorf, Iowa. Anna Sugarman. Oh. Hey, Anna. Good to see you. Oh, hi, Nasli. Nasli is a, a wonderful educator who's been in Hong Kong and Shanghai, and she's currently in Vancouver. Great to have you. And whoever, Kayla from Conshohocken, I'm really close to Conshohocken. <laughs> That's a stone's throw. I think my weather app says I'm in Conshohocken. So fun. Wow, okay. So it's true, we do have a lot of uh, the Americas, Mexico, Brazil, Honduras, Guyana, all over Canada, all over the United States. You would think by now Anna's gay, but. Oh, <laughs> hey, Molly Rose. Two days in a row now, so. Yeah, actually, a lot of wonderful dear friends are here. <laughs> Molly Rose, who's just left Sao Paulo, Brazil, and is back in New York. Great to have you. And Brittany from the International Educator in California. Friends from the mainline NAACP. Those are good friends of our families. You know my husband, Alex. Great to have Hawaii. Medellin, Colombia. I think we're going to have a good contingent from Colombia today. Great. Kansas and City. once again, it is the top of the hour, but uh, we're just going to give it a couple more minutes before we 
get officially started with the program. Um, again, great to see so many different folks from different parts of the world. And if you want to add your name and your location to the chat, that would be great. Um, we'll get started here literally in about two minutes. Bonnie Ricci, good to see you. Hey, Bambi, great to have you. We have a, I know we have at least one mother daughter coast to coast <laughs> online, so that's fun. And I think. Pennsylvania is uh, getting a big prize today. We very, have a good turnout. Very much represented today, yes. <laughs> very good. And Brazil, we have a lot of Brazilians <laughs> on today too. Hey Jane, good to see you too. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Thanks again so much, everyone, for coming to this session on building racial literacy. I'm Will Richardson of the uh, Big Questions Institute with my colleague, Homa Tavangar, and Eric Dozier, um, the two of them uh, with the Oneness Lab. We are really happy that you're here today for this very important and very uh, timely conversation. We had a session this morning at 7 a.m. that was, I thought, just brilliant. You're in store for some um, some beautiful music and some really um, uh, interesting thinking, and uh, we hope that uh, this will be a good spend, good spend of your next 45 minutes. So thanks for joining us. We are going to have some time at the end of this session for Homa and Eric to take a few questions. So I'm going to be actually just kind of the chat captain moderating um, what's going on in the uh, chat conversation. If you have questions that you might want them to uh, discuss at the end of the session, please add them there. If you have thoughts or reflections, please um, you know, put them in there as well, um, because it's always interesting for us to see what people are experiencing and thinking as we do these sessions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And again, thanks so much for being here. Eric, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. So good to uh, be here with you. Uh, we're going to dive right in uh, with, with a little centering, and I use music to center myself when I'm about to engage in this work, and maybe you'll know this song. If you do, just sing along with us. If not, just close your eyes and let it take you where you need to go. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made. ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway I saw below me that golden valley this land was made for you and me this land is your land this land from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and 
me oh this land was made for you and me oh this land was made for you and me was made for you and me this land this land was made for you and me there we go thank you so much eric um people get to get a little sense of why this work is means so much mm. to me to will to you um getting to begin with this gift that you offer this music means so much um and uh so we're going to go right into it we want to cover a lot of material we're going to be as uh, Will mentioned, um, we will be about 45 minutes and then we'll have a little more time for some Q&A after that. Um, so, you know, as we situate this conversation, we really situate ourselves in this moment. Uh, we think about how we are really living in this moment of at least twin, maybe more twin pandemics the pandemic, the crisis of coronavirus, and then this twin process, this epidemic of racism that, and racial justice that the world seems like it is waking up to, that we are living in this moment where there is this tremendous awakening all over the world. Um, books on anti-racism are the best sellers week on week over the last few months. Um, people want to have these conversations and we want to have this conversation. So we, we want to acknowledge this sense of awakening. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you might be awake, <laughs> but are you ready? You know, I was I was kind of the worst child to deal with in the morning when it was time to go to school. Like, you know, I hated getting out of the bed. <laughs> I remember my mom, you know, always coming into my room and saying, Eric, are you up? Are you up? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm awake. I know you're awake, but are you up? Are you out of the bed yet? I'm awake. <laughs> you know, I get a little, little louder <laughs> than my mom. I know that, but are you up? Did you take your shower? Have you brushed your teeth? Did you comb your hair? I had hair back then. Uh, did you iron your clothes? Are you dressed? Are you ready to walk out the door? You know, and I know we like to let people know how woke we may be, but waking up in the morning is hardly ever a glamorous affair. And, you know, we know that. We know it. <laughs> it takes work to actually leave the house and to get the work. So we, so, you know, we, we have a little bit more to do than just open our eyes. So we have to ask, um, what did it take to wake us up? Mm. What did it take to get us ready um, or, or to get us to wake up? I don't know that we're ready. Um, and so I think that many organizations, many universities, many schools, many, you know, everyone from NASCAR to uh, many other organizations, they said that it, it really was watching George Floyd be murdered in public, having that officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, such a long few minutes mm. of brutality and that, that helped them to realize the brutality that is surrounding us. And we wonder how much violence, how much murder, how much disenfranchisement did it take to jar us into awareness? And so, you know, 
that is what we are in. And the other part of that question is why did it take so long? Mm -hmm. This is this kind of violence is not new and this struggle is not new. And this is a chance also for us to honor John Lewis who just passed away this past weekend. Um, that John Lewis's life is a testimony to how long this struggle has been going on. For the last six decades, he marched alongside Dr. King as a young man and until his last days, he was speaking out. So um, why did it take so long? You know, we, we have to ask that. And we think that a lot of this has to do with an empathy gap, that there is this gap in perception, in lived experience, that there is this long historic process of othering throughout our institutions, which we will talk about, and so it's not that we don't see black people, it's how we see, and it's how we've been taught and we need to relearn. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what our responsibility is. Yes, yes. So, you know, it's how, as Homer said, how we've been seeing black people and making blackness mean a certain thing that has gotten us to this point. Uh, we've been swimming in stereotypes and misinformation and quite honest, honestly uh, lies about who black people are. Um, uh, Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly put it this way. He said that race is never just a matter of how you look. It's about how people assign meaning to how you look. So let's take a moment uh, and see how this has happened. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, I want you to do an exercise with me, but before we do that, I want to share this quote with you from one of America's, uh, and the world's most, uh, preeminent scholars, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and this is what he says, but in the propaganda against the Negroes since emancipation in this land, we face one of the most stupendous efforts the world ever saw to discredit human beings, an effort involving universities history, science, social life, and religion. So we're gonna do a little exercise right now. I want you to look at this picture that I have up. Uh, this picture is probably from around the 1840s. And give me a word, one word description of the people in this picture. Tell me what you see. And we're gonna give you a, a, you know about a minute to do that. Uh, we're on a little bit of a delay, and so, you know, it takes a minute for these things to get to us. Homer, as you see them, could you read them out to me? For some reason, I can't see, I can see the video, but I can't see the chat, actually. Yeah, yeah. and they're, they're, we're still waiting. So, so please, you can just share, this is a judgment-free zone. What yes. do you see in that picture that's on the slide? So, mm -hmm. foolishness, animalistic, animal life, mm -hmm. 1619 yep. project, offensive, cartoon, distorted, caricature, trash, distortion, misrepresented, dehumanizing, entertaining, entertainment, infantilized, exaggeration, wild-eyed, mm -hmm. dehumanized, animal-like, it's coming in fast, insulting, propaganda, little animals, caricature, right. dehumanized, foolish, unjust, horrifying, fear, worthless, circus, offensive right. they're just coming in and yes. i have to say just saying it out loud uh this dehumanization um when you stop to think about it it is it's painful to oh, yeah. even say this out loud and, the degrading and, how degrading mm -hmm. and inhuman dehumanizing it is yeah, yeah. And, so and, and, and yeah and when you think about that being repeated over and over and over and over and over again uh, throughout uh, history here, um, uh, it, it begins to seep into people's consciousness and not only the people that we are seeing on the, on the picture, but the people that are actually saying it and doing the, and participating in the defamation. Here's another example. This is a flyer from, uh, this was probably around the 1950s uh, when rock and roll was starting to uh, become the, the, the popular music of the day. 
And this is how the Citizens Council of Greater New Orleans described the music. They said the screaming idiotic words and savage music of these records are undermining the morals of our white youth in America. So you see those same things, some of those words that, that you use to describe the cultural production of the people. Um, and you might be saying, okay, 1840, okay, okay, 1950, okay, okay. But that was a long time ago, right? So here we go. The cover of Vogue, LeBron James. And notice the comparisons. Look at the mouth on the brute that you'll see on your, I think on your left, and then on the right, LeBron James. Look at the feet, look at the shoes, look at the white tips of the shoes and the white toes on the ape. Uh, look at the dress of the woman that, that, that the brute is, is ravishing. Look at the, the basketball and the, and the club. The club says culture on it. You know, what do you, what do you think they're saying about the culture? All of these different things. And let's note, uh, here that the stereotype of the brute is a very common racial trope used to refer to the viciousness of black men and their propensity for raping white women. Uh, this is the same stereotype that was used over and over as the go-to excuse for many of the lynchings that have occurred in America. Think Emmett Till, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you name it. Uh, even even when you're thinking about the the the, the young men in Central Park and how they were described in the media much the same way. Um, and, and this is not just in the United States, okay? Uh, the Netherlands, Aruba, you see it all over Europe with the, with the short Piet or, or, or Black Pete uh, caricature. Uh, let's look at, 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 the, at the lovely Prada bag and, 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 and uh, you know, observe the keychain on the, on the Prada bag. So, you know, you may think that these things are coming from crude places, but look at the nice shiny uh, uh, window display there in, at the Prada store. Um, uh, very reminiscent of some of these other caricatures and some of these images, even in uh, you see people donning blackface in Iran around a, a, a particular uh, holiday there. Um, uh, very reminiscent of those pictures and not only that, you see senators and prime ministers and celebrities all taking part in the, in the defamation of the character of black people and, and projecting that image out in the media. Now, as uh, Homa had mentioned earlier, when we start to think about what saying this over and over and over and over about a group of people can do, it helps put distance between you and them to the point to where you uh, uh, have the empathy for them literally taken out of you. And so uh, I don't know if you know of, of, of J. Marion Sims. He's known as the father of, of, of gynecology. Um, and, uh, you know, but how could, why would someone want to uh, protest one of the foremost pioneers of, of the medical establishment, you might ask? Uh, why would women be marching in Central Park dressed like this uh, with, with stained uh, hospital gowns on? Well, it's because uh, from 1844 to 1849, he engaged in some of the most gruesome experimentation on enslaved black women uh, to arrive at a lot of his uh, medical discoveries. Uh, Vanessa Gamble, in, a, in an interview, on NPR said this, she's a historian and a physician. She says that Sim surgeries on slave women were performed without anesthesia. There was a belief at the time that black people did not feel pain in the same way. They were not vulnerable to pain, especially black women and their pain was ignored. Um, you know, he not only did this on them without anesthesia, but he did this in front of a number of other people. So just think of the dehumanization that was taking that was taking place. And so when we think about saying their names, and I will say their names right now because he actually mentions them, Anarka, Lucy, and 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 Betsy, uh, who should be considered the mothers of modern gynecology since they had to endure him in in the in that research. 
But then again, oh, that was 1844 to 1849. But still, uh, a recent study, in a recent study that was done in 2016, researchers found that white participants, black participants, and nurses and nursing students assumed that blacks felt less pain than whites. Uh, uh, and it was a survey done that included medical personnel across uh, ver various sectors uh, in the field of medicine. So it's still going on, and it and it and it is be, it it is it is always exacerbating this lack of empathy. Empathy is always exacerbating the disparities that continue to exist in our country, and our world. And we can't talk about this empathy gap in medicine, in all these, in all the institutions that we know without centering this moment that we're in with such intense racial disparities amidst COVID-19. And you can look up study after study. This one is from the University of Michigan. There is extensive research published in the New York Times and many other media outlets showing that this theme of racial inequality of coronavirus. And so you can see, for example, Black people are three times more likely to have coronavirus and Latinos even more, maybe three and a half uh, at 73 per 10,000 people compared to 23 cases per 10,000 people. And then it's even more severe. It didn't even make that statistical chart when you look at Native Americans. So in Indian lands, that is where you see the most coronavirus at more than 10 times the rate of white Americans, 250 cases per 10,000 people among Native Americans. And so we have to go back and think about what is the impact of the empathy gap in terms of our response to this crisis that we are all collectively experiencing. Mm -hmm. And we know that a lot of you are educators uh, on this, uh, on this uh, particular webinar today. And so we have to take a look at education. Um, uh, in in uh, American schools, black boys are suspended at three times the rate of white boys for the same infraction. Um, uh, they've also found that the punishment that 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 accrues for for uh, for uh, black children in these environments actually is cumulative. So if someone black does something in the school earlier on in the year, and the the uh, the offense is repeated by another um, uh, black student, that they actually have to endure some of the punishment that the other child. Uh, ha, uh, had to endure, meaning that, that, that the punishment is multiplied and visited on, on children that, that commit the offense afterwards. But look at the black girls, the black girls is twice as much. Uh, and, and so, you know, what we're really seeing here is what happens when black people only live in white people's imagination. This is how it becomes dangerous. This lack of contact combined with the absence of true intimacy and compounded by the power dynamic has people deciding the destinies of people with whom they have little to no intimate contact. Um, you know, I love my comedians. And I think uh, uh, now that a brother Chris Rock could, could shed a little light on the, uh, on the subject. We live in a crazy time with Dr. King and Mr. Mandela's dreams are coming true. And black people and white people and Asians and Indians and everybody's hanging out together to have interracial posses. It's unbelievable what's going on, man. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. All my black friends have a bunch of white friends. And all my white friends have one black friend. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Always a good one. So <laughs> so, you know, what Chris Rock manages to make humorous is really a study um, that came out a few years ago showing that three quarters of whites do not have any non-white friends from any other background. And we think that this process or this state of not being in relationship, 
of not having proximity to people who look or live or believe different from you is dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, we A real imp interesting sign of friendship, this was a little factoid that was in the New York Times on July 12th, um, cites a study that shows that just 3.7% of whites were close enough to black people to include them in their wedding party. So mm -hmm. if that's like the ultimate good friend, over 96% of wet wedding parties of white people did not include black people or people mm -hmm. who, yeah. So yeah. what that's saying is that we are not living in an intimate relationship in these this level of such close meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and it hits us when we have that racial empathy gap, it hits us hard in the classroom too. It hits us in our ability to innovate. So this is a process many of you on this webinar are probably familiar with, the design thinking process. And it starts with empathy. It kicks off with empathy. You can't go to the ideating process in a fruitful way if you don't have that empathy. And if you're only empathizing for those who look like you or live or believe like you, then you're missing out on a big creative process. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about uh, this just very briefly in an article for Edutopia a few years ago. And I argued in there that empathy is the most important back to school supply. And at the time I thought it was like just a simple little throwaway idea. Um, this article ended up being the most shared article on Edutopia for about four years. It struck some sort of a nerve. And I think what happened when you look at the qualities of empathy and what it can help launch, like more meaningful communication, collaboration, deeper cognition, we see how empathy really stands at the heart of the 21st century skills that we're trying to impart in schools that do meaningful work, in schools that are really touching the lives of their students. So empathy is the thing that makes human learning powerful. And that is indispensable to building relationships. You, it, it really is at the heart of learning and it's at the heart of relationships. Mm -hmm. So this is one of uh, Homa and uh, my favorite quotes. And it says, do not be satisfied until each one with whom you are concerned is to you as a member of your family. Regard each one either as a father, as a brother, as a sister, or as a mother, or as a child. If you can attain to this, your difficulties will vanish and you will know what to do. Now, let's think about this. As a father, I will do anything for my two daughters. I will do anything to ensure their success. I will do anything to remove any barriers to their thriving in the world. Uh, the love I have for them inspires cre creativity. Uh, it, 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 it helps me to make a way where there is seemingly no way. Uh, think of what you would do to create an environment where your child or someone you dearly love uh, could achieve their greatest potential. If you can generate that love between the members of the human family, then as the quote says, your difficulties will vanish and you will know what to do when it comes to alleviating the division and suffering that is taking place in the world. You know, I love this quote, not because it gives us a clear solution or a canned answer. I love it uh, precisely because it doesn't. It is primarily about the central function of relationship, and that is to bind people together in such a way that they build a world with love as the central driving ethic. This love then sparks imagination and creativity and will produce the solution uh, that we need to build equitable and inspiring spaces. So to kind of bridge this gap to some practical steps, 
we think that it is essential. One thing that's essential to relationship is communication, Mm. that we have to be engaged with each other. And so racial literacy includes understanding the terms of that engagement. It helps us to not be so afraid. Um, And particularly when we are in relationship, we have opportunities to iterate. So we may not say all the right things at the right time, but when we have another chance and another and another, and I realize and I see in the comments, distance learning is gonna make it hard, but there is a possibility to iterate. We can over and over build that relationship. Um, And so why does racial literacy matter? Um, We draw from a, an idea that Howard Stevenson, who many of you probably know, he's been a wonderful mentor of mine, um, Professor Howard Stevenson at the University of Pennsylvania. He talks about the idea that practicing racial literacy, by practicing racial literacy, we can learn to not be so fearful and learn to problem solve together rather than run away from conversations on race. So it really is a problem solving framework. Um, And so Eric and I developed what you see on this slide. Um, This is really a heat index. It is um, an index of, uh, you'll see at the uh, left end, uh, words like harmony, like oneness. They're pretty cool on the heat index. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not meant to show parallel definitions, but just how as you used certain types of words the heat in the room may rise, especially if you are not used to engaging in conversations about race, if this is brand new, if you are just waking up to this topic. Mm -hmm. So as you rise on that heat index, you will notice that when you start speaking of social justice, being an anti-racist, anti-blackness, white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy, you may feel the heat rise at least Um, theoretically in the room. But what we urge you to do is be aware of that, you know, use that quality of metacognition, that ability to stay in the room when the heat rises, to listen when it's hard and clarify terminology, even as you are noticing it's getting harder to have this conversation, but staying in the room itself is powerful. And we have time to just go over a few of the terms during this webinar. So um, I'll turn it over to Eric to talk about the first one. All right, so here we go. (laughs) Ah, yes, there it is. That's one of our favorites right there, diversity. All right, that's what we want. That's what we need. Just gotta have it, as Brother James Brown used to say. Uh, maybe so, but maybe not so. Uh, It's our contention that perhaps the language that we have used to describe what we've been seeking uh, has the potential to be quite flawed, uh, and in some cases, even a little bit uh, deceptive. Uh, Let me put it another way. The plantation was diverse, right? So let's take a look at this picture here. This is a a, a indigenous uh, reservation school. Uh, Think about the diversity that is manifest in this picture. What do you see? You see distinct cultures, you see multiple spiritual traditions, uh, you see old and young, uh, it's intergenerational, you know, you got all of these things happening. Uh, It's racially diverse. But what we see is that a space can be diverse, but filled with dysfunction, inequity, and oppression. And let's be truthful. When we talk about diversity, what we've really been talking about uh, is primarily adding a dash of color to an all-encompassing, all-pervasive white environment that we assume to be the safe and constant norm. Diversity, if it remains superficial and episodic like pictures on a school brochure or a priority uh, in discussion only in response to a crisis or uh, you know, a number of events at Black History Month or uh, 
Native American History Month or whatever, uh, it, if it remains in that space, it can be hurtful and feel like a betrayal. Uh, we challenge you to reimagine how diversity can become a genuine cultural value that is necessary for a community's health. Wow, Eric, that was really impressive how you put those complicated ideas together. Uh, you were actually quite uh, articulate. Hmm. Well, th I guess thank you. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, Homer, like, you know, we're, you know, we're family. Our kids are cousins, like literally our kids are cousins. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that we've known each other long enough. And, you know, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask you a question. You know, it's sure. kind of, you know, I grew up in the 70s. And of course, you know, I knew about the, the Iran hostage crisis and all these different things. And I'm just wondering, did you know anybody that was responsible for doing that? Like, I mean, no, of course not. Oh. Um, so uh, just to relieve our viewers, uh, Eric and I, uh, we're, I'm a really poor actor. Uh, we were just trying to kind of role play examples of microaggressions. Um, and that's one of the terms of engagement to be aware of such a thing. So when I talk about him being articulate and he talks about a stereotype from my culture, those are microaggressions. And you might think of a microaggression a little bit like a mosquito or mosquito bite, where, you know, one is maybe not that harmful, but where there's one, there's usually more. And um, if you are bit over and over and over, you might start to develop a sensitivity and more serious um, conditions can grow from micro, from, from mosquitoes like West Nile virus, malaria, they all come from a you know, innocuous mosquito bite. Um, so, you know, it isn't that innocent. And so we have to ask, you know, micro, micro for who? Who's calling it so micro? Um, hmm. So let me see here. Let's, hold on, is that, Homa, can, can you see the slide? Can you see uh, that? I don't see anything there. It looks like a blank screen. Uh oh, I hope we're not having a technique. Hold up, let me see here. Let me <laughs> click that there. Can you can you see that now? Uh, I see that. <laughs> yep, I see that. I get where you're going now. Ah, yep. Yes, and you know what? That's that's kind of how it works. Uh, whiteness is always present but sometimes it's quite hard to see. Um, and that's because it's usually our default perspective and more times than not, we treat it as a neutral starting point, but it's far from neutral. Uh, as Berkeley professor John A. Powell says, white in America has always signified who is entitled to privilege. In this sense, the phrase white privilege is a redundancy. When we name whiteness or call out ideas like white privilege, white rage, white fragility, white superiority, white supremacy, all of these different things, you might feel the heat rise, not just in the language, uh, but in the room. So in our schools, this might be manifest by taking a closer look by, recognizes, by recognizing the voices that we might value in our assigned readings. If the curriculum is dominated by white authors, we might say, well, you know, we're reading the classics. But if you see whiteness, you're gonna note that the majority of perspectives from our big, beautiful, diverse world are simply missing. And we are not richer for that. And, you know, historically, it's always been more dangerous for black people to talk about whiteness and its impact than for white people to talk about it. Um, you know, for white people, seeing whiteness, even saying a person is white might feel uncomfortable because it means having to admit that whiteness, like that seemingly blank screen, is not nothing. Uh, Dr. Du Bois described it this way. He said it's like a property a package that comes with power and privilege. 
So this means that it cannot always fall on people of color who clearly see whiteness to be the ones who are calling it out. This is everyone's responsibility. So taking responsibility can take many different forms. And clearly there is a lot that we can do to educate ourselves on the impact of whiteness. That is a first step. That's a little bit of like getting out of bed, but it can also mean being an active ally and it goes deeper than that. What if recognizing how your skin color affords you certain privileges to move through the world in a particular way serves as a key to bridging the empathy gap? And we recently, like before when we were able to travel, um, Eric and I saw this play out. Uh, we were traveling to give a presentation and we had reservations that were made by our client on the same credit card. We were checking in at the same hotel at the same exact time. And it took me about five minutes to check into my room. I went up, I was really tired. So I just went right up. I was blissful, unaware of what was gonna transpire right after that. Uh, meanwhile, I'm in the lobby. I'm expecting the same thing uh, to happen for me. Uh, but the front desk attendant uh, questioned me on my reservation and I waited at the desk for about 45 minutes until things, I guess, kind of got cleared up. They still ended up putting me, putting the room on my card and not on the card of the clients, even though the client repeatedly told them while I was standing there on the phone and in emails that it should go on their card. Over the next couple of days, uh, we noticed uh, this play out in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a couple of other ways. Yeah, so there is no reason for Eric to have been held up repeatedly and for me to not experience that. We can't know if there was any malintent there, but that is also how some of this insidious dividing happens between people. And this is not a story about placing blame. In this case, what was significant to us was the response of our client, the organizer of the conference. They had their radar up. They were ready um, and they wanted to make sure that they did everything in their power in case something happened to not perpetuate unequal treatment. And that made a statement in itself. You know, they, I felt like they truly wanted to make sure that the impact on me was not devastating. They turned in to, they tuned in to lessen the blow uh, because they were aware of the historical patterns prevalent in our society that sometimes are at work uh, without us knowing it. Their priority was not to assess an intent that they could have never known anyway, but to address the impact that it could have on me. It even went further. Our client was seeking justice on my behalf and did everything they could going above, uh, above and beyond. Yeah, so the way that our client was alert to Eric's treatment, it did make a real difference. And that is an example of how seeing racial difference is not racist. Indeed, that recognition seeing race, it contributed to profound empathy. And the way that the client responded, it was as if they were looking out for a member of their own family. And so that takes us back to that quote that Eric shared earlier, that when the care we show each other is deep, as if we are in a family, our difficulties will vanish and we will know what to do. And so you know, at this time of such profound challenge, especially in terms of building that intimacy of relationship, because we're all gonna be online, it does take that level of creativity and that level of empathy to think about our students as, our, as truly our children, as our colleagues, as members of a family. It helps us figure out how to solve the problem we will know what to do. So we'll take some questions 
in a minute, but we have a, a special treat, a mm -hmm. special reflection right now. So uh, Brother James Baldwin says this, that the role of the artist is the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things that you don't see. costume jewelry look at her and see she had a hard time seventeen with a three-year-old daughter barely had a mother or father but she had a will to survive don't you look away, turn your face, don't you run and hide, watch your, what you say, you could be living life on the other side. Thank you so much. I know I speak for hundreds of people watching who really appreciate the inclusion of 
music and this chance to let some of this material just sink in and be a little less rushed in taking in so much information. Yes. Um, I just want to, we do have some great questions that have come in and we're going to uh, spend a few minutes. So the, you know, the official webinar, we wanted to give you 45 minutes and uh, we'll, for whoever can stay, we will answer some of these questions. We also want to share that um, this process of relationship building, we really um, think that it can be pretty systematic. And so Eric and I have developed these five essential elements of real relationship building. And you can see they have to do with frequency, proximity, reciprocity, knowledge, and imagination. Um, and we're gonna spend a little more time um, on August 17th and 18th. We have a, um, a two part, two hours each workshop on how to go deeper than diversity. And we think of it as exploring transformative principles in the quest for racial justice. And that's through the Big Questions Institute. And for those of you who are here today, uh, you can take 20% off with the BQI20 coupon code on the website. Um, and you know we'd love to have more of you because we know that there is a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, also we want to announce that the Big Questions Institute is offering next week on uh, July 27, 28, 29, um, for two hours a day at two, di two different time slots because we truly have um, boards and leadership of schools um, from all over the world. Uh, it's a limited number, but all over the world that are participating in a virtual retreat. And we're gonna look at some of the new leadership challenges and lenses and how to move from crisis management to meaningful change. And um, if you can't tell already, we think that equity is at the heart of meaningful change and that rethinking um, the way we do school and the purpose of school, uh, this is the moment to do it. So um, Will, who is uh, helping produce all this and has fed, um, sent your questions into the chat for us to see, uh, and I will be um, hosting that retreat. Um, but for now, we want to go to um, some of the questions. And so you can go to bigquestions.institute and get more information on that. Um, so I think I will try to integrate a few of the questions that I've seen. Um, there is, you know, a lot of wondering how mm -hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion, justice can be integrated into the culture of a school. So, um, and the culture of a school now means not being in a building. It means being online. So you can't physically uh, feel that energy of the child that you're working with. How do we uh, overcome that barrier to build relationship? And it's especially hard if your community seems homogeneous, um, if you don't seem to have a lot of diversity how do you start to teach racial literacy in that way? And there are a few other twists on this story, but maybe we just begin, um, are there some resources that you might suggest? And I'll, I'll ask Eric and then I'll, I'll try to take a stab at it um, to really lead to a culture of anti-racism. Wow. Um, uh, PhD dissertation yeah. there, but we'll, we'll try to do <laughs> yeah. this in three minutes. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are a lot, I mean, a lot of resources. I think, I think that, you know, instead of like just giving a list of things that you can, that you can get, I mean, there, there are a number of groups that are posting bibliographies and those things are easy things to find. Like they're really easy to find. You go to Instagram and uh, um, I'm just trying to think right off the top of my head you know, if you want to look at BLM, if you if you're looking for some youth um, uh, material, uh, the Black Youth Project is is a fabulous organization, uh, and I think uh, the Dream Defenders is another organization that that focuses on young people. Uh, they actually emerged after the Trayvon Martin shooting down here in Florida, and they were 
they have actually been working with Palestinian and Israeli youth to help them resolve some of their conflict there. So they do a lot of things around conflict management. They employ the arts and music and a bunch of things that, that would interest the, interest the young people too. Uh, you know, and also like when you're seeking knowledge, I think that in the background, you have to keep in mind what Dr. Du Bois said. Like all of our institutions have, 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 uh, have participated in the defamation of the character of not just black people, but indigenous people, um, Asian people, people from the, uh, you know, people from the Middle East. And not too long ago, if you go back a couple of generations, they were saying the same thing about the Irish. They were saying the same things about the Germans. They were saying the same things about Italians and Jews and, 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 and the Slovaks and all those different things. And so, and so I think that we, we, we may have to start to consider some non-traditional avenues of research because, because you know, if you're going to create a person that like we described as animalistic, that is unintelligent, that is all of these different things, you have, to, you have to then create an environment that will support what you think those people are. And so it's being reinforced everywhere. So consider looking outside the box. Uh, you may not find it in, in some of your libraries on campus. You may have to you know, go in and, and you know, but one of the best sources of information is the people. You know, if, if, if find the people, talk to the folks and, you know, see if you're received. And if you're not, you know, go back and ask again. <laughs> yeah, I think of thinking outside the book, too. Yeah, so thinking. Out, oh, interrogating, yes, that's, there you go. Interrogating the resources that we use. And especially it's important to have new voices at the table. So mm -hmm. one principle that I think about and I talk about all the time is go slow to go fast. So we have had, and I see questions coming in about addressing white fragility. We have been conditioned in these waters, racist waters, our whole lives. All of us are influenced by it. So if we slow down, if we take some time to learn, if we it does take more time to have more voices at the table. How do you wanna engage your kids because they're gonna feel really unengaged in online learning? help us rethink what we're teaching. What problem do you wanna solve? What matters mm -hmm. to you? Our kids are doing more learning outside the classroom, marching for the climate, marching for Black Lives Matter, marching against gun violence, than many times than they're doing in school. So if we invite them to the table to look for those resources, you know, that is a way to solve multiple problems at once and I think, you know, this idea of this metacognition of staying in the room and not allowing ourselves to be so quickly offended. And part mm -hmm. of it is because we wanna win. We feel like we're in this competitive race. And Eric, a lot of times you talk about like, it's not a microwave solution. It's not yeah. gonna be like, toss it in the microwave and in 60 seconds, it's yeah. heated up and ready to go. Right. This doesn't work that way. This is a constant, daily process. I am working on myself every day on this because I have been raised in, in a racist environment. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, you know, we, we have a time limit here, so we can't go into so much, but I think there are key principles of remembering how can I culture, nurture a culture of relationship, of listening, of empathy, if I put empathy at the heart of what I'm teaching, I probably need to rethink a lot of the books that I'm reading because yeah. I am showing a single story of a culture. I yeah. am plowing through because of expediency and I'm not noticing who might be hurt by some of the mm -hmm. material that we're sharing in our classes. Um, yeah. So many things, you know, you may not meet your child uh, your students the first day of school, but please learn how to pronounce their names. That's something personally yeah. that, you know, I loved going to school. I hated the first day of school. I hated having my name butchered every yeah. first day and just cringing at that. So there are so many ways that we can show care and empathy um, that have nothing to do with politics, that have nothing to do with um, 
you know, how you label yourself. And I see mm -hmm. there is that tension among staff, but there is a common need of love and care and empathy. And the golden rule is universal. Yes. So um, I think there's a lot that we can do. And, um, you know, being online, it just makes it a little more challenging, but I think we can practice radical imagination. So yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Look, that's actually a great place. place. Uh oh, we're losing you, great Will. Place. <laughs> uh oh. Can you hear me? All we right. Lost you. I yeah, hear yeah, you yeah. well. I got you now. All right. Sorry about that. So we're just going to pull this to, to a close because it is the top of the hour. But thanks so much, Homa and Eric, for uh, just an amazing um, 60 minutes of, of uh, wonderful music and wonderful conversation and thinking. Um, so many really great questions in the chat and apologies again, not just for not having the time to, to get to all of those. But the good news is we are going to do a follow up podcast here in the next couple of days addressing some of these questions and also the over 100 questions that people left um, when they were registering for this event. So wow. uh, that will be out within the next uh, week or so. And uh, we'll also be sending out a follow-up email with information and links and resources as well to those of you who, uh, who came today. So really appreciate it. Um, uh, we will see you online at the bigquestions.institute where you can get all the information about the work that Home and I are doing and also the information on the upcoming two-day workshop that Eric and Home are going to do. We're really looking forward to that. So thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate you being here today. Be safe, stay sane, and uh, hopefully we will see you down the road online. Cheers. Thanks for the great participation, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks.